Good morning. Today we'll be talking about a new topic. We'll be talking about uh, force and torque sensors. So uh, this is the first kind of sensors after temperature. And since uh, force and torque is uh, quite important for a mechanical engineer, we'll be spending an entire lecture uh, with this topic. Uh, we'll start with force sensors. And at the very end of the lecture, I will talk very briefly about the torque sensors. Uh, we will start with uh, how the force is measured. Uh, we are typically not measuring the force directly, uh, but uh, we measure some effects of the force. So uh, we will be talking about sensors that are called strain gauges. And uh, this sensor uh, transfers the force that you measure into the formation. So uh, we will create a deformation of an object and uh, then we will measure uh, this deformation and this will be calibrated in, in force. Uh, the strain gauges that uh, I will use here uh, look like this. Uh, so they typically are installed on some object. It could be a beam that you bend, for example. And uh, we will discuss the ways how to mount the strain gauges. We will have strain gauges that measure tension uh, or they measure compression. So the strain gauge is mounted on the object that we call a load cell. And uh, uh, we <coughs> uh, will discuss also the construction of the strain gauge itself. Uh, the strain gauge looks like this and uh, it will have uh, two directions, one in which it, it is sensitive to the force applied and one in which it's not sensitive to the force. And we will need to mount the strain gauge correctly on the load cell or on the beam uh, in order to measure what we want. So uh, there will be different placement for strain gauges if you want to measure axial force, radial force and so on. Uh, we will discuss two types of strain gauges. Uh, I will focus mostly on uh, the metallic strain gauges because uh, those are the most common ones. Uh, we will discuss briefly also semiconductor strain gauges so that you see what are the advantages and disadvantages of those devices. They are used as well, but uh, they are not so common as wire strain gauges because you will see they have many disadvantages. Uh, so this is an example how a metallic strain gauge looks like. Uh, the metallic strain gauges uh, can be either wire or foil. Uh, when it's a wire strain gauge then the sensitive area is made out from wire and uh, if it's a foil then it's a thin layer of um, constantan and then this will be the sensitive area. Uh, the principle in both cases is the same. Uh, we are looking for very small changes of electrical resistance uh, that are caused by uh, the applied strain. Uh, in case of the semiconductor, the material is completely different. It's a semiconductor material of different types. Uh, we'll see it has some advantages, but also some disadvantages. So let's start with the wire or with the foil strain gauge. Uh, the construction is the following. You have always some uh, backing material. It could be either uh, paper or uh, it is um, kapton, which is uh, a plastic material. And uh, on this backing material you have a sensitive track of wire or of a foil. So if it's a wire strain gauge then this is a wire. If this is a foil strain gauge, uh, it looks like this. And here you see the this black area is the foil. Uh, I have some examples of uh, both strain gauges here for you. So uh, those are wire strain gauges. I'll, I'll pass it to you. You can uh, take it out from the box and you'll see that the strain gauge is made uh, from a very thin wire. Uh, the wire is made from constantan. Constantan is an, an alloy from couple 
copper and nickel and uh, it has a quite special thermal coefic coefficient of thermal expansion it's not expanding uh, almost at all with temperature and as we will see soon uh, the temperature compensation is uh, very crucial for the strain gauge because if you do not have temperature compensation you are not measuring force but you are measuring temperature either temperature expansion temperature changes but only if you compensate for temperature then you are able to measure force so here this wire is made from constantan uh, if it is uh, a foil strain gauge uh, then uh, you have the same backing material which in this case is typically Kapton and uh, this uh, backing material is uh, laminated onto the Kapton and uh, then it is etched away at the places where we do not want the, the, the material, the constantan. So uh, it is produced with the same technology like printed circuit boards. It starts uh, as a laminated stack of the Kapton and the conductive layer. Then uh, you deposit the, la the mask layer on uh, the places where you want to protect the material from etching and then it's uh, etched away with, with some acid. Uh, I have a video later where you will see this, how, how this is produced. Um, you see here uh, we have terminals where we connect the uh, strain gauge to an external circuit and the sensitive uh, area of the strain gauge is here. So this, those tracks here, uh, that's the sensitive area where we detect the small resistance changes as created by the applied force. And the sensitive direction of the strain gauge is in the horizontal direction here. So the strain gauge, if it's created like this, is sensitive in this direction. So we want a maximum sensitivity in this direction and we want to uh, have zero sensitivity in this direction, so in the lateral uh, third direction. Uh, the real foil strain gauge is shown here uh, on this picture. Uh, so this is the, the backing material, uh, this is the strain gauge itself, and here uh, you have uh, terminals uh, that allow you to connect the strain gauge to an external circuit. Uh, either this is spot welded or uh, welded with ultrasound or it can be even soldered. Uh, when you buy a strain gauge it comes like this and uh, this is also a Kapton material, a Kapton tape which allows you to handle uh, the strain gauge and install that on some, uh, on some beam or on some mode cell. I have here some examples of foil strain gauges uh, that are already installed on this, let's say this is just a metallic block uh, to, to demonstrate the, the assembly. So the strain gauge is in the middle, then uh, you have the two terminals connected to a wire, so this could be connected to a measurement instrument, and then the terminals are soldered uh, to the strain gauge, and then they are fixed with a, a special adhesive uh, on, on the basic material. Uh, when you install the strain gauges, it's not a, that simple procedure. Um, strain gauges are basically glued to the object, but you need to be uh, very carefully preparing the, the surface in order to prevent corrosion and in order to protect the strain gauge. We'll see uh, the installation on some pictures a little bit later. Uh, so this is a single strain gauge. So this is a typical uh, device, but uh, for many applications uh, you already know that you need to measure the strain in multiple directions. So a single strain gauge is good if you want to measure a strain in an individual direction, if you already know what this direction will be. Uh, if you don't know that, you may use uh, multiple strain gauges installed on the same backing material. Uh, this is called a strain gauge rosette, and uh, here you see some examples. So, for example, uh, this strain gauge rosette has two strain gauges installed on the same backing material. Here, this strain gauge would measure in this direction, this strain gauge would measure in that direction. Uh, you can have um, st a strain gauge rosette with three strain gauges. So this is an example here. So one, two, three strain gauges. 
um, under the angle of 120 degrees. And uh, from the theory of um, elasticity of materials, you probably know that uh, if we measure the strain in three independent directions, like 120 degrees shifted, and we may calculate the direction of the main stresses. So uh, if uh, you have a component where you want to measure strain and you don't know what is the direction of the main stress, then you may install a strain gauge rosette like that, measure the strain, and then calculate back uh, what are the directions of the, of the main stresses. Uh, there are other applications as well. Uh, a strain gauge uh, does not have to be used only to measure strain um, that is caused by some force due to load in some object. But uh, a strain gauge can be used also to measure, for example, uh, residual stresses after heat treatment. So that's the example here in this, in this picture. Uh, this is a strain gauge. You see one, two, three strain gauges on a strain gauge rosette. And uh, if uh, you want to measure what is the stress in your material after heat treatment, then uh, after you, you do the heat treatment, you uh, install the strain gauge on top of the material, and then you drill a hole uh, in the middle of the strain gauge rosette, and this releases the stress, and you are able to measure that. Of course, you destroy your object or you damage it, but it gives you an idea about the size of the stress after heat treatment. I have later some animation uh, when we will be talking about applications. So, uh, a strain gauge rosette simplifies the installation of strain gauges uh, because uh, you don't need to measure yourself the angles uh, on the strain gauge. Uh, of course, you can take two individual strain gauges and install them like this. Then you need to maintain 90 degrees precisely here. Here you need to maintain 120 and so forth. So uh, a strain gauge rosette um, is not necessary, but uh, you, you may use uh, individual strain gauges as well. Uh, so how does it work? Let's imagine uh, we have a strain gauge. Uh, I will show it here on the example of a wire strain gauge, but uh, it works in exactly the same way also for uh, all other strain gauges. Uh, so imagine that we have a strain gauge here, and this strain gauge is applied on some object. It could be a load cell, it could be a beam that I've been trying to bend. So if the applied force is zero, uh, we have some initial length, L, and since force is zero, the strain is zero. So we will measure uh, some initial resistance in the strain gauge. Uh, if I am apply compression on the strain gauge, uh, there will be a small change of uh, the length of the strain gauge and, of course, of the cross-section of the wire. Uh, so here, for compression, I will have smaller length and uh, larger cross-section. If I apply tension, there will be a very small change in length of the wire, so the length will increase just a little bit and uh, the cross-section of the wire will decrease. So in this case, I have a longer wire and a smaller cross-section, so this will give me larger electrical resistance, and this will give me smaller electrical resistance. You can imagine, you can play with a rubber, and you will see that this, this really happens. So uh, we know that the electrical resistance of the wire depends on the length of the wire, on the cross-section, and on the resistivity. The resistivity is given by the material, uh, the length and cross-section is given by the construction. So uh, we could measure uh, directly the electrical resistance of the strain gauge, and we uh, could say, okay, this corresponds to, to that force. Uh, however, the change of electrical resistance is very, very tiny. So uh, if uh, your initial resistance is, for example, 120 ohms, then the change in electrical resistance caused by applied force will be, let's say, 10,000 times smaller. So it will be sometimes in the order of milliohms. So we would need a very, a very accurate uh, device to measure electrical resistance. 
And for this reason, we are never looking directly for the value of the electrical resistance, but we are looking for the ch change. How much did it change since, since last time? We'll have special circuits that will help us with that. So we are not looking for R equals to something. So R is a function of force. But we are looking for uh, this. This is a change of electrical resistance as a function of strain. And strain will be defined as a change of length. So now some equations. So if I take uh, this equation for the electrical resistance and I want to calculate its change uh, over strain, uh, we can calculate partial derivatives of this equation. So I take this r equals to rho over r over a, and uh, I will calculate partial derivatives. So I'm looking uh, for some formula that will say uh, how much is the electrical resistance changing if I change length, how much is the resistance changing if I change cross-section, and how much is the resistance changing if I change uh, resistivity? All those three variables will change uh, if you apply strain. Uh, length will change because if you apply compression, it will get sm get shorter. If you apply tension, it will get longer. Uh, cross section, there the reason is the same, and resistivity will also change uh, with the applied strain. So we can. Uh, derive that this component for electrical resistance change over length uh, is given like this. So this is a partial derivative. So we see a uh, partial derivative of R over L. is um, This is a constant and then we have some change of length and the other ter terms uh, follow the same, th the same logic. So we are looking for an expression that will say us how much is the electrical resistance changing if I know uh, how much is the length, cross-section and resistivity changed. Uh, th there is definitely a relation between cross-section and between length of the wire. So uh, we can simplify this equation if we uh, substitute instead of change of cross-section uh, the properties of the material and we will uh, get that is it's minus 2 times mu, and mu is the so-called Poisson constant, which is a material property. Uh, for it, it is uh, different for every material. Uh, for technical materials like steel, aluminium, uh, rubber, uh, it is somewhere in the range of uh, 0 0.2 to 0 0.5. So for rubber, you have 0 0.5. It means that if you stretch rubber, uh, it um, shrinks the cross-section. If you compress rubber, it uh, extends the cross-section. Uh, steel and aluminium, uh, they, they do not stretch as well as rubber, so uh, they have the Poisson number a little bit smaller. Uh, we'll need that also for the material, uh, but luckily uh, this is defined by the manufacturer. He specifies you uh, what value this is, and he will give you not directly this, this number, but he will give you the sensitivity of the strain gauge. Uh, it's always written on the back, uh, and uh, it will there will be some small differences between individual batches, uh, and we will see that this is also affected by the material. So now uh, we have only two variables left. We have length and uh, resistivity left in the, in the equation. So we may write the result, and the result is this. Uh, change of electrical resistance depends on strain times a constant value. Here, this constant will be called a gauge factor. And uh, in this constant, uh, you see that we have hidden the material here in this Poisson number, and the material is also hidden in this changes of resistivity. So the only thing that you need to remember here is this part of the equation and this part of the equation. So uh, dr over r equals some constant times strain. But you need to know 
that uh, in this gauge factor uh, we hide multiple properties. Uh, we hide the pure geometry which is given by the Poisson number and we hide there uh, the uh, resistivity. Uh, this is a general formula that applies also for the semiconductor strain gauges um, and uh, especially this part uh, is, is quite significant for semiconductor strain gauges. So for metallic strain gauges uh, we have mostly this, this term uh, but for uh, semiconductor strain gauges we will have two and we will see that this will have a huge effect on the gauge factor but it will also have a huge effect on the linearity of this equation. Uh, if you would look only on this equation it looks as linear. <coughs> if, this is, if this would be a constant value then uh, the, the, the chart will be, uh, will be a straight line but uh, since this is changing and this is changing with applied strain uh, for semiconductor strain gauges we will see that this is not a linear dependence. But for metallic strain gauges at least in uh, the range where we use the strain gauges uh, it is very good linearity and that this will be a <coughs> very, uh, very uh, good property for the metallic strain gauges. So, uh, K is called gauge factor and uh, in other words it describes sensitivity. So if I would plot the chart uh, between strain and between the change of electrical resistance uh, we will see something like this. So we will have some initial value of electrical resistance and then uh, this there will be a linear change but once again this applies only for uh, metallic strain gauges uh, in the small uh, range where we, where we use that. Uh, so now let's take a look on some gauge factors for different materials. The gauge factor depends on the material so if we would use uh, a different material we would have different sensitivity. Uh, so here you have some materials that may come into uh, question for a strain gauge construction. Uh, we have already been talking about platinum for temperature sensors. You see it has a quite large sensitivity, 6.1, uh, but platinum uh, has uh, a large change of electrical resistance coming from temperature. So platinum uh, is a good material for temperature sensors but it's not a good material for strain gauges where we want to eliminate the temperature dependence. So for strain gauges uh, we use constantan which you see is an alloy of nickel and copper with this proportion 44% nickel and 55% uh, copper and uh, constantan strain gauges uh, have uh, a sensitivity or, the g or gauge factor uh, around 2, so 2.1 uh, on the bags that you have seen here uh, it's written 2.08 something, something like this. So constantan is the material that is used for strain gauges. No other materials are used for strain gauges. Uh, if you would look on this table then for example nickel looks quite nice you see it has a large sensitivity minus 12 it's minus but doesn't matter so by looking on the value it would seem that it's an ideal material because it has a six times higher sensitivity than constantan so the slope would be six times steeper here but uh, here you see the reason why uh, we are not using nickel uh, this is this chart it relates uh, strain and change of electrical resistance and the sensitivity is nothing else than the slope of this, uh, of this curve at individual points. So here you see we have constantan, it's nice linear dependence. If you for example look on nickel here initially it decreases electrical resistance, that's the minus 12, the minus sign. Uh, there is a quite steep change in uh, resistivity but then uh, it increases again and uh, here it is constant. So if, if for some reason we would use nickel uh, 
as a strain gauge. Uh, we could not use it here because we don't have a defined dependence between strain and resistance. Here you see it first decreases and then increases. Uh, on the other hand, Constantin uh, has a nice linear dependence in the whole range where we use that. You see also here uh, it goes from 0 to 1 percent of the strain. So the strain that you apply needs to be very, very small. So we typically uh, apply strain like 0 0.5 percent, something, something like this. And you see the change of electrical resistance is very small. It's like 3, 2 or 3, 4 percent. Uh, the other materials have similar properties like nickel. Uh, for example, if you would use uh, an alloy of rhodium and platinum, uh, it would have a linear dependence here for very small strain, but then a nonlinear dependence here. Uh, also, uh, an alloy of rhodium and platinum uh, would be uh, quite expensive compared to constantum. So for this application, constantan is an ideal material because it has a linear dependence and its uh, dependence on temperature is very, very small. Uh, the basic resistance of uh, metallic strain gauges is uh, 120 ohms. So you can see that there is a difference uh, between uh, the platinum RTDs for temperature which typically have 100 ohms, and strain gauges have 120 ohms. Uh, you so you can very easily, if you have s just two wires coming out from your application, you can very easily distinguish temperature sensors and strain sensors, because you just take a voltmeter, you m an ohm sorry, ohmmeter, you measure the resistance, and you see, okay, it has 100 ohms, it's probably PT100, or it has 120 ohms and it is probably a strain gauge. Uh, the other uh, that resistances that you may find are also 350 ohms. Uh, that's less common and even less common is uh, 1000 ohms. So uh, 100 ohms and 350 ohms are uh, the most common ones. Uh, the resistance of the strain gauge that you see here is uh, defined for 23 centigrades. So not for zero as for RTDs, but for 23 centigrades. Condensation is absolutely essential uh, for a strain gauge. If you do not do temperature compensation, and if you do not do it correctly, then your strain gauge will not measure temperature, uh, but it will not measure force, but it will measure temperature changes. Uh, just to show you how crucial th this is, uh, I have prepared a calculation example uh, where we will compare two strain gauges, one from Constantin and one, let's say, fictional strain gauge uh, made from copper. So copper is not a good material at all for strain gauges, and you will see why. The reason is that it changes quite much uh, the electrical resistance with temperature. So. The calculation uh, will be done uh, for a metal metal beam, a metal bar with a cross section of uh, one square centimeter. So it's quite thin, it's some, not a little bit smaller, smaller than this. Uh, so we have a cross section of uh, one square centimeter. Uh, the material is steel with this Young's modulus. And uh, we will apply a force that equals roughly to 100 kilograms. So uh, it looks like this. This is one square centimeter. And we have two strain gauges mounted on this beam. Uh, strain gauge one is made from Constantin. Uh, you see that Constantin has a quite small uh, uh, temperature coefficient of resistivity. Uh, so it's not changing resistivity that much with temperature. Uh, the second fictional strain gauge would be made from copper, and here you have the same temperature coefficient of resistivity. So you see uh, Constantin has like three orders of magnitude smaller uh, temperature coefficient of resistivity. So let's do the calculations. So uh, if I apply the force on my beam, uh, on 
one square centimeter cross section uh, I will calculate the tension stress it's nothing special te uh, 10 megapascals so not nothing for steel and uh, the strain that you apply on the beam uh, is uh, 50 times 10 to the power of minus 6 uh, this is also sometimes called 50 micro strain so this will be the value uh, that we will need into our equation so here you see uh, we are looking for the relative change of electrical resistivity uh, and this is uh, this is uh, the strain that we have just calculated so the 50 micro strain and k is the gauge factor and uh, I will assume that it's a metallic strain gauge with a gauge factor of 2. I did not consider that uh, here Constantin uh, and Copper have different gauge factors, but we will see that it will not have that big effect on the result. So you see that the relative change of electrical resistance caused by the 100 kilogram load is very, very small. It's a really small number. Uh, if we would look for the uh, absolute value of resistance uh, for a 120 ohm strain gauge, uh, then uh, we can calculate that it is 12 milliohms. So we have uh, 120 ohms strain gauge, and here we have uh, caused 12 milliohm change just by uh, loading that uh, with. Um, 100 kilograms so it's uh, very tiny uh, the circuit that we typically use for a strain gauge is a Wheatstone bridge and uh, we'll discuss it in in a few minutes uh, but here I have used so-called one quarter bridge and the output voltage that I would get from this one quarter bridge from the 100 kilogram load would be 0 0.3 millivolts so 300 microvolts, so a really, really small voltage uh, and you want to measure force of 100 kilograms. So from the force we have 12 milliohms and 300 micro microvolts. So now let's take a look uh, what would be the effects of temperature. So let's imagine um, the sun starts shining on uh, my, my steel bar uh, and uh, it will cause the change of temperature in the strain gauge of just 10 centigrades. That's nothing unusual, you just open the window, uh, the cold or hot air comes in and you have this change of 10 centigrades. So if you calculate this for Constantin, you see that we would have a change of uh, roughly 10 milliohms. So this is uh, equivalent to adding another 100 kilograms load. So this is uh, roughly 100% uh, relative error. And for copper, you see that the change of 10 centigrades uh, would cause a change of 4.7 ohms. So this is uh, like th at least uh, three orders of magnitude bigger uh, than uh, the effects that you have created by force. So uh, this is the reason why copper is not used for strain gauges. But even if we use Constantin, uh, which has a very, very small uh, temperature coefficient of resistance, the change caused by temperature may have the, the same size like the change caused by the force. So uh, you see we have 12 milliohms and if we do not do any temperature compensation we may have the same change in electrical resistance caused by temperature. So temperature compensation is absolutely crucial and uh, if you don't use that it will not measure temperature, it will not measure force but it will measure temperature. So that's an illustration uh, why it is so important to have temperature compensation. And we will discuss circuits uh, that do this, uh, do this for you. Uh, just one side note uh, related to semiconductor strain gauges. Uh, since they are not that common, we'll just briefly discuss their properties, but we'll not use them in our, in our labs or in our applications. Uh, there are several principles behind semiconductor strain gauges. Uh, in all cases, it is also changing electrical resistance as a function of applied strain. Uh, I recommend you to try out this website, uh, which has uh, quite nice animation 
showing the principle. So here you see we may have a composite material, uh, which is typically a polymer or a thick film material. And here we have conductive particles, and if we press uh, the material, if we compress the material by applying the force, the conductive particles come closer and this decreases electrical resistance. So this is also one of the principles uh, behind uh, semiconductor strain gauges. Uh, the other is uh, that we are using something that's called piezo-resistivity. That's the typical property for silicon. And uh, it has uh, also an effect on electrical resistance. The advantages of uh, semiconductor strain gauges is that uh, it has a much larger gauge factor. Uh, the typical gauge factor for a metallic strain gauge is 2, and uh, for a semiconductor strain gauge is uh, larger than 100, so 150, so that's a typical value. So you see uh, we have at least uh, 25 times higher uh, sensitivity if we use a semiconductor strain gauge. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have uh, a nonlinear dependence between strain and resistance. And we have a much larger uh, temperature dependence. So the typical, uh, typical influence of uh, temperature on uh, resistance for a semiconductor strain gauge is uh, about 75 times higher than uh, for a metallic strain gauge. So we have seen what effect does temperature have on wire strain gauges. It's really large. And for semiconductor strain gauges, it's even worse. So say 75 times uh, worse result if your temperature is changing. So semiconductor strain gauges are good if you know that you really need this high sensitivity. Uh, but uh, it, it's uh, not a good idea to use them if you know that your temperature will change in, in large range. So it's a good application to have that in a, in a lab where you know the temperature might change plus minus 5 centigrade. But it's not a good idea to use semiconductor strain gauges in applications like exterior applications where your temperature may change quite rapidly. Um, semiconductor strain gauges, uh, they typically are much smaller than uh, the virus strain gauges. Uh, so here you have some pictures of semiconductor strain gauges. Uh, including dimensions, so this is the typical size. So it looks like a rectangle of semiconductor material. Uh, typically, this is so between 2 and 20 millimeters. You see here, this is between 0 0.1 and 1 millimeter. So if you are limited in space where you can install your strain gauge, then you may uh, use this semiconductor strain gauge, but if you are not limited, then you should prefer the metallic strain gauges uh, because they are linear and they are not as much te temperature dependent as the semiconductor ones. Uh, to give you an idea how is the dependence looking like, you see the equations here. So this is uh, resistance and strain. So for the metallic strain gauge, <laughs> we had uh, a constant times strain, so we have linear dependence. For a semiconductor strain gauge, you see we have multiple values here, C1 and C2, and here we have epsilon and epsilon squared. So this is a nonlinear dependence. Uh, the same applies for temperature. You see we have multiple coefficients, and here the temperature is squared, so this is also a nonlinear linear dependence. So if you know that your temperature will not change that much, uh, if you will be working in a very small range, then you can use this without any trouble, but if your temperature will change, then uh, don't use that. Now, I have some examples here uh, of uh, semiconductor strain gauges, so I will pass you those uh, strain gauges, so th they are without the backing materials. Uh, you will see that uh, they are very, very small. Uh, the ones I have here, um, they have dimensions of something like 0 0.5 millimeter. Um, this, this 
dimension and this is uh, roughly 10 millimeters. Uh, it's very, very fragile. Uh, so it's quite hard to install uh, on the material uh, and uh, it breaks quite often. So uh, here you need to apply special glues and handle that very, very carefully. Uh, if you have the strain gauges with the backing material, then obviously it uh, requires a larger space to install that, but it's less sensitive to, to mechanical damage uh, during the installation procedure. Um, so, uh, let's take a look on circuits that uh, are used for strain gauges. Now we will discuss uh, basically three circuits uh, and all those circuits will be including the temperature compensation. Because without uh, temperature compensation, it doesn't make sense at all to use a strain gauge, because in the first place it would be a thermometer and then uh, it is a strain gauge. So we'll start with uh, the connection that is called a one-quarter bridge. Uh, it is a one-quarter bridge with temperature compensation, uh, the strain gauge that measures something, so the effect of train, strain, is this one. So we see all my uh, resistors in the bridge have the same initial value, R0. So if I choose uh, 120 ohm strain gauges, then this would be 120 ohms, 120 ohms here, 120 ohms here, and this would be also 120 ohms here. Uh, the single resistor that is changing with the applied strain is this one. You can uh, place the resistor at any position in the bridge you like. Uh, I for no or for no reason at all I have chosen this position. So this uh, resistor is changing by the strain that I apply, and the change is the delta R plus or minus. Uh, we have already seen that the value of delta R is very very small, like three orders of magnitude smaller than the value of R0. Now, if you analyze uh, this circuit, uh, you will find the equation uh, for the output voltage, V0. We'll not do this analysis in, in this course. It's done uh, in some circuits analysis classes. Uh, but uh, we typically measure this with a voltmeter require that this voltmeter has a high input resistance and we are looking for the dependence between V0 and between the strain that we apply in this resistor, in, the, in this strain gauge. So the bridge acts uh, like an amplifier that amplifies the small changes caused by the strain to a voltage that we are able to measure. We have seen in the example calculation that even though we use this uh, kind of amplifier, uh, we the voltage will be very small and uh, we will need a very sensitive voltmeter and additional circuits eventually. Uh, by circuit analysis, you will come to an equation that is written here, and this equation is called the equation of balance for the bridge. So uh, the voltage on the output of the bridge, V0, will be equal to zero if you maintain this uh, condition of balance. So if R1 times R4, so this resistor times this resistor, uh, I should have uh, noted the, the, the names here. I will do that right now. So this is, uh, this is R1, this is R2, uh, this is R3, and this is R4. So if uh, in uh, my equation I maintain this condition of balance, then uh, the bridge output voltage will be zero. Uh, we are typically um, measuring directly the voltage, uh, so uh, our condition, our bridge is not balanced. Um, but uh, if you want a precise result, then uh, you 
try to balance the bridge uh, by changing the components here, by changing the values of the components so that you are looking for the zero voltage here. So this is done typically in labs uh, where you want a precise result and where you don't have where you don't want any trouble with nonlinearity. Uh, because this bridge connection is a nonlinear connection. So even if there is a linear change in strain here, uh, if you measure directly the voltage, uh, the connection itself is nonlinear. So you will not have a linear dependence between V0 and applied strain. So for this reason, we are trying to balance the bridge. We are looking for zero voltage V0. And uh, if I'm looking just for a single value for zero, I don't care about the, the linearity of the connection. So this one quarter bridge connection uh, has one element that measures force, but we need another element that will compensate for the temperature changes. And this is uh, this resistor RC. Uh, you see that in uh, my equation here, um, it's R2, so it's on this side of the equation, on the right side. And my strain gauge is on the left side of the equation. So if uh, I install the strain gauges uh, in such a way on my beam or my load cell that uh, the resistor R1 and R2 will have the same change of temperature, let's say they will increase the resistance with increasing temperature, then if I have an increase here and then the same increase here, it will cancel each other on the equation. So it will compensate for temperature changes. Uh, I could also uh, install the compensating resistor in this place, in place of resistor R3. But the point is that in, uh, so to in order to make it work, I need to install that on the other side of the e equation of balance uh, where I have the measuring strain gauge. Uh, I could also have the strain gauge in R4 and in this case, I could have, uh, you see, R4 would be the strain gauge, and I could have still R2 and R3, the uh, compensating ones, or I could have uh, R3 as a strain gauge, and then R1 or R4 could be the compensating strain gauges. So it doesn't matter where you install that, but if you uh, want to compensate for temperature changes, uh, the compensating strain gauge needs to be always on the other side of the equation of balance. So here in this one quarter bridge connection uh, we have four resistors one, two, three and four but we have only one strain gauge that measures the force. The second strain gauge is installed but it does not measure force it is compensating for temperature. So those two resistors are typically in your instrument, uh, in the bridge, but uh, this is a strain gauge installed on your load cell and this is a strain gauge installed as well on the load cell, but this one measures the force and this one measures or compensates for temperature. So if uh, I look on this connection, uh, we can uh, also uh, draw a dependence between V0 and between strain and it would have obviously some slope. Let's say uh, for one quarter bridge let's define it as one. And now uh, we are looking for a way how we can increase this sensitivity and uh, we want to maintain the temperature compensation. So we can uh, add another strain gauge in our application, we can have a half bridge connection and in the half bridge connection we are using two strain gauges. Two strain gauges measure force and two strain gauges are used for temperature compensation. Uh, since now we have two strain gauges uh, we will have two options where to install that. Uh, the first one that you see here is um, for applications where your strain gauge uh, measures in the same direction. In other words, uh, we have uh, two strain gauges installed and they are both measuring either compression uh, 
or they are both measuring tension. So uh, here uh, we have one strain gauge at this position, we have one strain gauge at this position. Uh, it's the, the names of the resistors are still the same, so this is R1, R2, R3 and R4. And if I uh, write the condition of balance, so let's say R1 times R4 equals uh, R2 times R3. So now uh, I have two strain gauges. So R1 and R4 is changed by strain. And since it's on the same equation side, then if I increase this and I increase this, then I will unbalance more the equation which will give me a higher output voltage. I could install that also on the other side, so I could install that as R2 and R3, but uh, I need to maintain the same side of, this of the equation. Uh, the other resistors you see here, the red ones, are uh, used for temperature compensation. So in this case, R2 and R3 are also strain gauges installed at the load cell but uh, they are on the other side of the equation and they are compensating for the temperature changes. So this is the connection uh, if you, you are able to install strain gauges that measure the same thing. So both measure compression or both measure tension. In some applications you may use uh, one strain gauge that uh, will measure compression and one strain gauge that will measure tension. So in this case, uh, we need to reposition the measuring strain gauges uh, on, uh, in the circuit in different positions. So uh, we will have still the equation of balance. But uh, if now one strain gauge is increasing resistance and one strain gauge is decreasing resistance, I need to place them on uh, the other side of the equation. So here, for example, uh, I have uh, R0, that's one strain gauge, and the second strain gauge, now you see it's minus plus, and this is uh, decreasing electrical resistance with uh, increasing applied force. So for example, uh, this one measures compression, and this one measures tension, or vice versa. So in this case, I have uh, R1 and R2 in the equation, and the compensating uh, strain gauges are R4 and R3. And based on uh, the option you want, you will need to connect the strain gauges uh, in your connection, and you need to install uh, the strain gauges on the load cell or on the beam correctly. We'll discuss that in a few minutes. Uh, if we look on the output voltage of the one half bridge. Uh, if we have a one half bridge, then uh, we are using two strain gauges and this doubles the sensitivity. So uh, the change of output voltage is twice as big as uh, compared to the one quarter bridge. So that's the whole point here. Uh, we have installed two strain gauges, but this doubled the sensitivity. So we have higher voltage uh, and the cost uh, was just to install another two strain gauges on our load cell. Uh, strain gauges are not that expensive. Uh, the strain gauge, the, the foil strain gauge that you, uh, that you have seen here, uh, like, like this one, uh, it's like 100 check round, something like so, so like 3, 4 euros. So it's not that expensive and uh, by installing two of them you double the sensitivity. So what if I want even more increase the sensitivity? I may use four strain gauges that measure the strain directly uh, and this is a full bridge connection. So you see now uh, we have uh, four strain gauges installed on the beam or on the load cell. Uh, we need two of them to measure compression and two of them need to measure tension. So here you see uh, R1 and R4 are 
plus minus delta r so they are on the same side of the equation of balance and uh, r2 and r3 are minus plus delta r so uh, they need to measure the opposite stress compared to r1 and r4 so if your application allows you to install four strain gauges if you're not uh, restrained by space uh, by cost then the full bridge is the best way that you can use how about temperature compensation does it work here it does because if I assume that all strain gauges uh, have the same temperature then if I increase for example R1 then all others will increase as well so I have an increase on this side of equation and the same increase on this side equation so the effect will cancel each other so a full bridge uh, has also the uh, temperature compensation feature so compared to the uh, to the one half bridge we also have four strain gauges but in a one half bridge we use two strain gauges to measure force and two strain gauges to measure temperature or compensate but in a full bridge connection we use all four strain gauges to measure force and to uh, do temperature compensation if you compare uh, sen the sensitivity of full bridge to one half bridge it doubles the sensitivity if uh, you compare sensitivity of uh, one quarter bridge and one half bridge the uh, the full bridge the full bridge has four times higher sensitivity than one quarter bridge so uh, in uh, applications with strain gauges if you're not really limited by space uh, a full bridge connection is used almost exclusively so uh, in weight applications uh, you will always find four strain gauges uh, that do temperature compensation by itself and uh, they have the highest possible sensitivity out from those three bridge connections um, I have here um, some uh, example calculation uh, with a full bridge that will show you what are roughly the values of uh, resistance and voltages that you may find in a strain gauge applications uh, so in this case they have used uh, 350 ohms they apply strain then those are the values that you may expect so 350 was the initial value for 23 centigrades and for for a zero strain now the full strain is like one ohm plus here uh, like one ohm minus and the output voltage from this full bridge connection you see it's roughly 27 milli millivolts so it's still very small uh, you cannot transfer it to large distances and you typically need uh, an amplifier that sits right behind this bridge and amplifies this uh, DC voltage so uh, now let's take a look on the way how we install strain gauges uh, on uh, beams um, for different cases so uh, all these examples uh, will be done for a full bridge connection because that's the typical one so we're using four strain gauges but we will just install them in a different way on on the beam so let's say I have a beam like this uh, here the beam is fixed in some wall and I want to measure axial force in this beam <coughs> and I want to compensate of course for temperature I want to compensate for bending force so FB and I want to compensate for torque that I may apply on this on this beam so uh, the bridge that I will use is shown here always R1 R2 R3 and R4 and for this connection uh, this is the correct way of installation so here you see I have R1 and R4 they measure 
the axial force. If I would apply bending force, Fb, uh, then R1 will measure tension and R4 will measure compression. So Fb will be compensated because here I have R1. R1 due to Fb is increasing, but R4 due to Fb is uh, decreasing. So I assume that they have a linear dependence, so uh, they will cancel the effect of bending force. The same thing would happen if the bending force would go uh, from this side. So then uh, I would see also the compensation because uh, I would have R2 and R3 and this will be compensated as, as well. Uh, the same happens for torque. For torque I use R2 and R3. So you imagine I apply torque, I try to bend the, the beam like this. So uh, let's say R3 is being extended and R2, R2 is being compressed. And since this is again on the same side of the equation, it will compensate for torque as well. So if you have a full bridge connection, if you install the strain gauges like this, it will be good for measuring axial force, but it will compensate for bending force, for torque and for temperature. What if I want to measure the bending force? Well, if I want to measure the bending force, I need to rearrange the strain gauges on the beam. So this is it. Uh, still uh, the same bridge. So in electrical way, the connection is exactly the same, but uh, the strain gauges are installed in a different way. So you see they are now all facing in the axial direction. I want to compensate for axial force, for temperature, for torque, and I want to measure only bending force. So here, uh, if I apply axial force, I stretch R1, R4, R2 and R3 all in the same way. So in my equation, all will uh, change by the same amount. So the bridge will remain in balance. But if I apply uh, the bending force, here I will apply tension to R1 and R4. So R1 and R4 are here. So let's say uh, they will increase the resistance. And uh, here R2 and R3 will see compression. So they will decrease the resistance. So this will be a smaller value. And uh, the bridge will be more unbalanced and I will see a higher output voltage. The same works also for torque. Uh, you may test it yourself. So here this arrangement is good for uh, measurement of bending forces. Uh, and the last thing will be torque. I will have a shaft and I want to measure the torque that is being transferred by this shaft. Uh, again, a different arrangement in mechanical way, but uh, exactly the same connection in electrical way. So it still is a full bridge connection. But now here you see the strain gauges are installed under the degrees, under 45 degrees related to the axis. Why? Uh, because uh, from uh, elasticity of materials it is known that the, main, that the direction of main stresses uh, for torque is under the angle of 45 degrees related to the, to the axis. So here you see I have R1 and R3. So uh, R1 and R3 are on the different sides of the equation. Uh, if I apply torque, uh, then I will have one stress like this and another stress like this. Uh, so I need to have R1 and... Uh, and uh, yeah, there's a... And <coughs> this should be, this should be R2. This should be R2 and this should be R4. Uh, and uh, R1 will have the same direction like uh, like R4. Uh, let me let me correct that. So this is this is R4 and this is R2. 
Uh, and uh, I will have a compensation for axial forces and I will have a compensation for bending forces. Uh, you see here I need to maintain this 45 degree and I need to maintain 90 degrees between uh, the strain gauges. So uh, this is exactly uh, an application for a strain gauge rosette uh, because you have already two strain gauges installed on the 90 degrees angle and you just need to place them on the shaft. Uh, if you look on some more sophisticated solution, uh, you will find out that uh, you may combine those those uh, installation examples. So you may have uh, this uh, strain gauge rosette installed for torque plus uh, another strain gauges for axial forces and for bending forces. So you are not limited in using only four, uh, but uh, you are limited by the number of four in the bridge connection. Uh, I have here an example uh, of uh, a strain gauge in, uh, in weight application. So this is, this is a weight. You see over here, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a beam and the beam is fixed on this side. And uh, if I put some weights on the platform over there, uh, the strain gauges are installed on the top and on the bottom of this, uh, of this beam, of this load cell. The deformation will be in the middle. And uh, uh, we will, well, you will see that this on the, on the lab class, but they are strain gauges installed in many directions. So not only in uh, torque and uh, uh, other configurations, but it's combined. And uh, now uh, I will show you how accurate uh, this is. So uh, this, I this weight uh, measures up to 7.2 kilograms. And uh, the resolution that you can achieve is one gram. So if you calculate the accuracy class of this, it's really, really precise. Uh, since the strain gauges are installed in multiple directions, uh, you it does not matter where you put the weight because the torque and all other forces are accounted for. So let's, let's see that. So here uh, I have a, a weight of uh, one kilogram. So let's, let's put it here. Should show, okay, so 1,005 grams. And now uh, let me add uh, one gram somewhere on the weight and we should see uh, s something happening. Okay, so we see 1,006. Uh, since it measures in two multiple directions, here it doesn't matter where I put the weight. So let me put uh, the one gram here and one kilogram over there. And we should still see uh, the, okay, it's a little bit different, but 1007, let's say. So uh, weight applications uh, with strain gauges are really accurate and uh, you can expect a really good resolution uh, with foil strain gauges. Where do you mount the strain gauge? Uh, the strain gauge uh, is either mounted directly on the object itself. So if um, I have a beam, for example, I may mount that on the beam. Uh, if it's uh, a construction, I may mount strain gauges directly on the construction, uh, on the bridge, for example. Uh, if uh, you cannot mount the strain gauges directly on the object, uh, you can use a load cell. A load cell is uh, an object that, where you apply the force, you change the shape, it's being deformed, and uh, you have strain gauges installed on the load cell. Uh, so load cells are typically used in uh, weight applications. So something like this, uh, where you add your individual, uh, individual loads and you weigh them. Uh, we will discuss just a few types of load cells. Uh, I'll start with the S-type load cell. Uh, the S-type load cell looks like this. You see, it has a form of letter S. Uh, 
uh, you apply the force from the bottom and from the top. So here you have typically some threads where you mount something. And uh, the strain gauges are installed here in the middle in a cavity uh, that is typically sealed uh, in order to prevent corrosion of the strain gauges. So this could be a stainless steel block. Uh, there is a hole that's milled in the middle. Uh, it looks like this. And the strain gauges are installed over there and then this is covered uh, with another stainless steel plate and typically welded uh, so that it's hermetically sealed. Uh, the S-type load cell has a very good protection against overload because here you see I have this space over there. If I apply too much force this will bend and this will bend but uh, when those two surfaces touch each other, the stiffness of the uh, piece will increase rapidly. So uh, there is a good protection uh, of, uh, for overload for this type of uh, float cell. Another example is uh, the beam load cell. Uh, this is uh, basically this type of load cell. So a beam that is fixed on one side and fixed to the platform on the other side. So the platform can move freely up and down. So we typically have uh, the load cell attached here to the base of your device. And then here there is another platform attached to, uh, to the top and this deforms the load cell. Uh, the strain gauges are installed in this hole. This hole is again hermetically sealed and uh, you again use a full bridge connection in this application. Um, you may look on, the, on those videos, how does it work, we'll not go through it right now, but it's nice introduction how, how does it work. Uh, the beam load cell does not have such a good overall protection as uh, the S-type load cell. So the beam load cell is uh, used in applications where you do not expect uh, the overload to happen or uh, you have to find another way how to protect the device from overload. Uh, if you look for example on this on this weight, if I would overload it, then the overload protection is done by, by, those, uh, by those spacers. If I apply too much force, the platform will sit on those spacers and will not uh, deform the load cell anymore. So um, this is also one way how to protect it. For uh, higher loads, for waiting airplanes, trains, and so some, some very uh, heavy devices, uh, we can use a compression load cell. So you can imagine a compression load cell, um, it's a beam of material that's here, this thing in the middle, and the strain gauges are installed on the beam and you compress all of them. And in compression you have a high stiffness, so uh, you have a high rating, high capability uh, to, to measure the load. So this is used typically uh, for for waiting large large devices like trains, for example. So now some applications of uh, strain gauges. So uh, I have selected only a few of them. Uh, so you may find strain gauges uh, that measure uh, the tension in uh, railway tracks caused either by the trains that are passing or by the temperature changes. So then it looks like this. This is the railway track. Uh, here you have the strain gauges installed. Uh, in all those applications you need to protect quite well the strain gauge itself. So uh, it never looks like this. The strain gauge just on the material. But you have many other materials, uh, many layers that are protecting the strain gauge. Uh, by the way, this is uh, the same strain gauge like uh, you have seen here. It has just a different uh, applied layer 
and you see that this layer was not as good as the previous ones because it corroded in in few months or few years. Uh, strain gauges can be used to measure strain in um, mechanical applications. So here you see you have a pin and one, two, three strain gauges that measure uh, the uh, the strain. Uh, you may uh, have that on on shafts or or cam shafts or um, any basically mechanical device that you can you can find. Um, one in interesting application uh, you may want to analyze the strain on on a bike during a ride so uh, here you see uh, that's the frame of the bike and here uh, you see installed strain gauges so one two three four and so on so uh, multiple directions multiple places uh, to analyze uh, the stress on the on the frame um, it could be used for example to verify final element calculations of this frame or to verify if the welds are done correctly or uh, if you can save some material by reducing the weight and so on. Uh, other application still strain gauges so this is this is a bearing you see strain gauges installed on the bearing uh, here you see some um, some shaft so here again strain gauges and so on. You may find s many uh, examples of, of strain gauges. Uh, strain gauges are not limited only to metallic materials, so uh, you can install strain gauges also on composite materials like this. So this is a carbon composite. You see we have strain gauges over there. Uh, those are blades of, of a fan, uh, of a compressor, so you may install that also on a rotating part. But uh, in this case, uh, you need uh, typically a wireless transmitter uh, to get the data out. So it looks like this, a rotating shaft, a wireless transmitter connected to strain gauges. Uh, typical application uh, where you find strain gauges are weight applications, so, uh, so weights. Uh, you may find that also at home. So here I have an, an example that, that's a personal weight and here uh, there is a beam over there. The beam is attached to one side of this, of this stack so it sits on ground and the other side is attached to the platform and uh, where when you stand on that. Uh, it's not very good visible inside but there is a full bridge. So we measure how much is this beam deformed and then the full bridge goes to these electronics and it tells you how much you wait and if you should uh, stop eating uh, cookies or whatever. Uh, you may find uh, strain gauges also outside so I found um, some interesting pictures here uh, so this was an application where they were looking for uh, eventual changes on um, on a piping system go going from uh, a hydro plant, so they installed strain gauges on uh, the on the pipes, and uh, they were looking uh, if something is changing, uh, if there is additional strain in the pipes because they were doing some uh, some groundwork near near nearby. So this is a strain gauge. This is the strain gauge covered, so it needs to be covered and protected quite well. Uh, one last example is uh, the residual stress application. Uh, so uh, if uh, you are looking for s residual stresses after heat treatment, uh, it looks typically like this. You have some residual stresses and you don't know how big that is. So we install a strain gauge rosette on top of the material uh, and uh, then you glue, you drill a hole in the middle. The effect is the following. Uh, by drilling the hole you are releasing the stresses that you have in the material. Uh, it's a complete procedure how fast do you need to drill, how deep and what needs to be the RPM. But you if you follow this procedure uh, the strain gauge then will give you uh, the 
amount of stress that is that was released uh, when you were drilling the hole. So this destroys your object, but it gives you an idea uh, what are the effects of uh, the heat treatment. Uh, really last thing for strain gauges and applications, I found this interesting. Um, how do you weight an airplane? Uh, well, uh, this is a this is a strain gauge weight. Uh, the airplane uh, is being pulled to the weight you see under each wheel. Uh, you have you have this weight, and the reason why you do this for airplanes is to keep the the plane in balance. Uh, this was uh, I've read in the this application after refurbishing the interior, so they needed to rebalance the airplane, so they weight. Uh, the, the the airplane and they find the center of gravity. Uh, a video, well, um, take a look at home on, on the video. Unfortunately, we have only 10 minutes left. Uh, but it's really interesting. It's how strain gauges are made and how they are installed and how they are used in a truck scale weight applications. Uh, the last thing I would like to discuss for strain gauges is uh, how to select them. Uh, so first of all, you select uh, the strain gauge or strain gauge rosette based uh, on your uh, knowledge about the application. So if uh, you know the direction of your main stresses, then uh, you can use a single axial uh, strain gauge. So single axial strain gauge looks like this. Uh, if you don't know uh, or if you don't want to measure single axial stress, then you may use a 90 degrees rosette. But this already assumes that you know the main direction of stresses. So that you position one direction in <coughs> one, <coughs> main <coughs> one, ma <coughs> one main stress and the other direction in the, in the other main stress direction. Uh, if you don't know uh, the direction of the stresses, you may use a strain gauge rosette. So then you install a strain gauge rosette, you measure strain in three uh, independent directions, and then you calculate what is the main stress direction. Uh, and the second uh, option, uh, or the second uh, parameter, if you select uh, a strain gauge, is uh, if you are limited in dimensions or not. So if you are not limited in dimensions, then uh, you need to ask yourself if your material uh, is uniform uh, in the whole area where you measure. If it is, uh, then uh, you can use this. Uh, the, the length is limited only uh, by the place where you want to measure. Uh, if uh, you have, for example, this, this picture, uh, if you have inhomogeneities in your material, like some grains, then uh, the grid length, the strain gauge grid, needs to be longer than the, than the particle size here, than the grain size. Because the uh, strain gauge is cal calculating nothing else than uh, an integral over the entire length. So if I would place that, over the grain, I could measure something else. Uh, if uh, I have uh, a homogeneous uh, material, I don't need to take care about this. I am just limited by the available area on, uh, on my application. OK, so that's it for strain gauges. And just uh, a last uh, two slides uh, related to Torque sensors. Uh, torque sensors are nothing else than stray gauges installed on a shaft, and you transfer somehow the data out of it. So uh, you may find this shaft with four strain gauges. You see, I measure torque, so I measure, uh, I install that under 45 degrees. Uh, so this is the bridge, it's a full bridge, and uh, this is the power supply. It could be a battery as well. And this is nothing else than a way how to get the data out. So it could be uh, encoded into pulses. Uh, today it's typically transmitted via wireless transmission. Uh, 
uh, but the shaft is still equipped with the strain gauges. Uh, there is a quite large difference between uh, torque sensors that are good for fixed applications and that are used for rotary applications. Uh, here you see an example of the fixed application. So it's an armature that you install on one side of your device, an armature that you fix on the other side. This whole thing is not rotating, uh, so you don't need any data transmission. So there is a cable. Uh, to give you an idea about the price, see, $500 roughly. Uh, if you want to make it in a rotary application, then it becomes uh, about 10 times more expensive for the same range. So here uh, you see that's uh, an example of a rotary torque sensor, input shaft, output shaft, and strain gauges installed on the shaft, wireless transmission from the rotor to the stator, and then there is a cable coming out. Uh, you see like the 10 times higher price. Uh, torque sensors are typically uh, quite expensive. Uh, I have one here, I will not pass it. Uh, it looks like this, you will have a chance to see that on the lab class. This one is for 20 Newton meters and uh, 50,000 RPM. And just uh, to give you an, an estimate, this is roughly 8,000 euros. So it's like almost uh, half of a car, just the torque sensor. Uh, <coughs> last slide, applications of torque sensors. So they are used in applications where you need to measure the torque characteristic of motors. Uh, so this is uh, a motor, a torque sensor and a load. So here you see we need the rotary application. Uh, one interesting picture I found, this is uh, a torque sensor for 1.5 mega Newton meters. You see the size, uh, it's used in uh, both in, in ship applications to measure the torque of, uh, of um, the, the motor that is applied on the propeller of, of the ship. Any questions? Okay.